for those who are just dialing in, we're just going to give it another minute and then we'll get started. Thank you. A very good evening to those in India and the East, good afternoon to Europe, and good morning to those waking up in the United States. My name is Rudra Chaudhary. I'm the director of Carnegie India. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming you to the 11th India and the World webinar. In this very special edition of India and the World, we are privileged to discuss and explore Anand Krishnan's magnificently crafted book, India's China Challenge, published by HarperCollins. This is a book that has something for everyone. The only denominator is an interest in and for China. Anand spent 10 years as a correspondent in China, traveling to all but three of China's provinces and regions. Each section of this treatise is littered with a sort of humor, character, and seriousness that immediately brings the many protagonists and voices in Anand's incredible journey to life. Whether it's a take on Mao's China, which is etched in the voice of a certain and living Mao Yushi, the economist and reformer, who unhesitatingly relays to Anand the challenging proposition that the legitimacy of the party comes from success in conducting reform and opening up, and not because of Mao, or a shop owner in EU, please excuse my Chinese pronunciation, which happens to be one of the largest producers of Indian deities, or director of the Chinese tech giant Baidu, who is, or at least was, clear eyed about the attractiveness of the Indian market. Whether the reader is a traveler looking for a deep introduction to China, through the many decades since the creation of the People's Republic, or a venture capitalist wanting to get a more real sense for Chinese entrepreneurs' appetite for the future, or a policy expert looking to get a sense of China's Chinese negotiators' finer perspectives on the border dispute with India. This book has something for everyone, and in equal measure. In the end, Anand's fellow travelers that mark each and every section of this book serve as interlocutors. It's almost as though they themselves have scripted their lives through Anand's ink and pen. To discuss these stories of China's rise, we're joined today by a very special panel of speakers, Indani Bakshi, Taylor Fravel, and Srinath Raghavan, and of course, the author himself, Anand Krishnan. Indani Bakshi is the diplomatic editor of the Times of India. Indani covers daily news on foreign affairs, the foreign office, as well as interpreting and analyzing global trends with an Indian perspective. Her blog, Globe Sporting, is perhaps the best read longer reads on crucial questions on and around foreign policy. She joined the Times of India in 2004. Earlier, Indani was an associate editor for the premier news magazine, India Today. Indani started her journalism career with The Statesman, where she was the weekend editor before moving to the Economic Times in Calcutta to edit the Metro magazine. She graduated from Loretto College in Calcutta and has been a Reuters Fellow at Oxford University. She also has fellowships or has done fellowships at the Asia Foundation and the Brookings Institution. M. Taylor Fravel is the author and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and Director of the Security Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Taylor studies international relations with a focus on international security, China, and East Asia. His books include Strong Borders, Secure Nation, Cooperation and Conflict in China's Territorial Disputes, published in 2008, and Active Defense, China's Military Strategy since 1949, that was published last year. It is the book on Chinese military doctrine, Taylor shows how and why the doctrine has changed as many as nine times, and why the current doctrine instituted in 2014 is perhaps the most challenging yet. It is one that inevitably reflects the ambitions of Xi Jinping's global China. Taylor's other publications have appeared in just about every top international relations journal, a Rhodes Scholar and Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Taylor is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Committee on US-China Relations and serves as a principal investigator for the Maritime Awareness Project. Srinath Raghavan is a senior fellow at Carnegie India. He's also a professor of international relations and history at Ashoka University. He is possibly the best known and read historian of contemporary India. Srinath's four single authored books still date, cover everything from a strategic history of the Nehru years to the global history of the birth of Bangladesh 
a magnificently detailed yet easy to read treatise on India and the Second World War, and an elegantly sweeping history of the United States in South Asia. His other publications and edited books are far too many to relay here, but have clearly and crucially contributed to a much needed and growing genre of works on contemporary India. Anand Krishnan, our star for the evening today, is a Beijing correspondent for the Hindu and the author of the book that we're here to discuss, India's China Challenge, right here. In 2019, he was a visiting fellow at Brookings India. He was previously the Beijing-based associate editor at the India Today Group. Anand has closely tracked Sino-Indian relations for a decade from the boundary question and the rapidly expanding trading relationship to the long history of cultural engagement between the neighbors. Before I turn to our special guests, a couple of housekeeping points. We have over 300 people registered for this event today and many more joining us on YouTube. For those on Zoom, if you have a question, please pop them in the chat box in the center bottom of your Zoom page. For those on YouTube, please add your questions in the comment section and they will be related to me and I'll take them back to our star cast. We've kept the rundown for today's webinar fairly simple. I've asked Anand to spend 10 minutes framing his journey for this audience without perhaps giving too much away. I believe the book is also available online at a discounted price. I'll then turn to each of our other special guests to give us a brief sense of how they read the book from their different vantage points. We'll make sure that we have enough time for questions and conversations. So with that, over to you, Anand. Thanks so much, uh, Rudra, for that really warm and very kind and generous introduction. Thanks also for taking the time to read the book. Um, and really uh, very happy to be here. And thanks also to Carnegie India for doing this event. Uh, very grateful for how you've organized it. And of course, to Indrani, Taylor, and Srinath as well for making the time uh, to be here today. Uh, so what I thought I would just do was try and explain why I wrote this book uh, and what some of my main takeaways are. Uh, and of course, uh, do the very easy task of summing up in five minutes what has been a 10-year journey for me. So I'll do my best. Um, so I moved back to India in August 2018. Uh, this was after two stints in China uh, and nine years in China as a reporter, uh, first for the Hindu newspaper and then for India Today magazine. Uh, so this is basically my attempt of trying to make sense of everything that I saw in China and lived through in China. Uh, and of course, I th think I was very lucky to be there uh, at what was a very, very interesting decade, very eventful decade. I moved just after the Olympics uh, of 2008. Uh, and when I arrived there, it really felt like uh, a time of great openness in China, uh, not just for foreign reporters, but for Chinese journalists as well. Uh, there seemed to be a feeling at the time of opening up. Uh, and there really was, it felt to me at least, a sense of inevitability that China was on this linear path towards opening up greater openness. Uh, and here, I just don't mean economically, but uh, politically, uh, of course, within limits that the party would tolerate. But of course, I think all of those impressions turned out to be grossly mistaken. Uh, and in this book, even as I look back today, uh, November 2012 and the ascension of Xi Jinping really strikes me as such a transformative moment, uh, both for developments within China politically, and I think also for its relations with India uh, and with the world. And I think that anyone who lived in China in this time would probably keep going back to that moment as, as something being so pivotal and I think something that we're still trying to make sense of. What I try and do in this book is look at uh, China's internal political, economic, social changes that I reported on over the past decade. I think so at the outset, I should say that this is, I think, more a China book uh, rather than an India-China book, which I think some people expected. Um, and I think there are enough of those. So I think my aim was less to try and do an India-China comparison, but rather just try and explain how these transformations in China have uh, ended up shaping its relations with India. And that's, of course, a question that I try and keep uh, coming back to throughout the book. Uh, I think the book is primarily an, an on-the-ground perspective of a reporter. It's not an academic or scholarly book or an IR book. And I think that it's informed mostly by, uh, I think, interviews uh, that I conducted with the range of people that I was very lucky to meet uh, during those nine years. And so if there's one aim that I really have, uh, it is to try and present a range of Chinese voices uh, and to try and help 
make sense of all these changes that we keep reading about uh, from the perspective of people in China who've lived through them. So I've organized this book into six parts and each of these parts explores a different dimension of China and what I call India's China challenge. Uh, in the book, I argue that India faces a four-fold challenge, which the first four parts of this book address. I'll briefly go over what these challenges are. Uh, the first is the political challenge, uh, which is dealing with a one-party state in China that is looking to increasingly shape uh, global institutions in line with its values. Uh, so I think it's uh, ever more important for us to try and ask, what are those values? Uh, and try, try to understand what these values are. Uh, part one looks at, at uh, the rise of Xi Jinping and how in many ways he has very dramatically changed uh, China's party state structure. Uh, the way he has brought the party back uh, to the fore, uh, the way he has centralized power and essentially dismantled this uh, collective leadership system, uh, which of course, in many ways, I think uh, was a very unique model for an authoritarian state. And I think in many ways really was the bedrock in allowing China to carry out three very successful transitions of power. In the book, I also look at uh, the pandemic. I finished writing this book uh, in early August. So I did have some time to try and make sense of the debates about the pandemic. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting that to me, it seemed that uh, the debates about the China model in many ways uh, have been getting sharper after the pandemic. Uh, and in a strange way, I think reinforcing people's ideas rather than changing them. I think for people in China, uh, the way they have uh, responded to the pandemic uh, following those initial missteps in Wuhan, and the way they have recovered, I think it really has revalidated their beliefs in their own system for many people in China. But I think for many people abroad, uh, who I think who have focused more on the initial missteps in December and January and the cover up in Wuhan, I think for them, it has really underlined the weaknesses of this very same system. I think the second challenge after the political one that I look at is the economic challenge. And this is of course learning from many of the right things that China did uh, and of course, from India's point of view of navigating a very difficult relationship, a trading relationship that has always been lopsided and increasingly is becoming, I think, a, a really a conflictual trading relationship. Uh, I look at how the nature of uh, the India-China trade relationship, it's changed so dramatically, uh, I think since around 2013 and 2014, which coincided with two big developments, the huge surge in Chinese overseas direct investment and something that people didn't really expect or, or were very skeptical of, which is China really emerging as a tech power and as an innovating power, which a lot of people thought would never happen. And both these developments really have impacted India in very different ways. Uh, and we can talk about that later, but I think these were trends in terms of Chinese companies coming to India, investing in India, uh, looking at India as a big market. These trends really didn't get all that attention in India until I think this summer's events on the border where India is reassessing this relationship, uh, even though it's been something that's going on for the last four or five years. A third, of course, is a diplomatic and military challenge. I look at the boundary question and a very complicated bilateral relationship. I think the summer has reminded us of that. I also try and look at China's changing worldview under Xi Jinping and what that really means for the relationship. I think since the normalization of ties in 88, uh, both sides have really done quite well in keeping this relationship going uh, with this mix of cooperating on some issues and competing on other issues. And there were many global issues like climate change or trade where they do see eye to eye and they see some sense in standing together and pushing for reforms of global institutions where they both have a stake. But the question that I ask is, are these shared interests uh, including uh, bilateral convergences like trade, the shared interests that provided a very strong logic to keep this relationship going and not descending into discord, even though you had so many problems like the boundary or even Pakistan. With China's changing view of the world that you see under Xi Jinping, is that logic now getting diluted? I think that uh, that really is a very big change and one perhaps we're only beginning to come to terms with and maybe haven't devoted much attention to. Lastly, I look at the challenge of history, which I think is perhaps the most ignored challenge. But for me, I found the most enjoyable to research and write about 
I think maybe because that was my subject in university, I think which also left, uh, left me with this very deep belief, which I think is not really shared by colleagues in the diplomatic field, that I think confronting the past is so crucial to dealing with the future uh, if we want to live with each other. Though I think the view among officials is no good comes from rehashing these old unresolved issues. So I look at the origins of the boundary dispute and the memory of 1962, which is still such a traumatic memory for policymakers in India, for people in India, I think to a degree that people in China don't really understand. The fifth part of the book uh, looks at China's frontiers based on several reporting trips that I made to Xinjiang and Tibet, which were two places that I really became uh, in some ways obsessed about uh, during my time in China. Uh, and also uh, on the situation in Hong Kong, where I lived for a few months in 2019 as a visiting fellow at Hong Kong University, which happened to coincide with the protest there. So what I try and do is try and present a different view of China as seen from its frontiers. Uh, and I think that I look at Taiwan as well. And I think that it does present to us a very less confident and less resilient picture of the China model in ways that we often don't realize when you look at it uh, from these four places. The last part of the book has portraits of uh, six people that I that uh, really left a deep impression on me uh, in China from different walks of life uh, and six people who have very interesting threads to India. So in short, I think my hope in writing this book is to try and present a different picture of China to challenge conventional wisdoms that we have on everything from the, the role of the Communist Party, the China model, uh, the how economic reforms unfolded in China to even the boundary question and the war and to try and present a different picture as I saw it. And I think uh, in some sense, uh, just to wrap up, I think it's also in, in a way it's a plea for us, especially in the media, uh, to, to try and pay more attention and devote more resources in covering this country and understanding this relationship as well, which is something that you'd be surprised despite its importance uh, I think something we really haven't quite done enough. I think on that note, I will end, Rudy. Thanks, Anand. Before I turn to Indrani, can I just ask you one question is, you know, so there are these six inspirational portraits that have obviously touched you, um, you know, which you collect in the last part of the book, but the entire book is full of examples of stories and interviews and people who kind of, you know, add a certain amount of thickness to each of the segments that you've just walked us through. Were you surprised by how open people were on what are essentially hugely political questions, whether it's the economy, whether it's Mao's legacy, whether it's India? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And someone actually asked me this at an event that I did a few weeks ago, uh, a very sharp observation. They said, you know, I noticed that most of your sensitive interviews that you did seem to be from, your, from the early part of your stay in China from, from 20, 11 and 12 and 13. Why was that? And I think that that made me think quite a bit about the fact that I did find myself surprised when I first got there in terms of the degree to which people were opening up and willing to speak uh, in a way that as an Indian reporter, I didn't expect. I think a lot of Indian reporters still have the view that this place is a monolith, that everyone speaks in the same voice. That was something that really struck me when I moved there. And that was one, one thing that I it really drove me to write this book. But the sad irony is that I think by the time I left China in 2018, it was a very different China from the China in 2008 that I landed in. And I think that a lot of those interviews that I did then, I probably would not be able to do today, which is a, a little bit of an unfortunate uh, detail about how this book ended up. Okay, thanks, Anand. Um, Indrani. Uh, thank you so much, Rudra, for, uh, for this event. Thank you. For Anand for this wonderful book. Uh, I have to admit that I had a sneak preview and I uh, enjoyed every bit of the book. Um, of course, as Rudra mentioned, the six stories um, were, were not just inspirational, they were like windows. And um, I think you captured them really, really well. Uh, especially, I like the, the, I like the, the Maritime Museum. I like the Hong Kong stories. And, uh, but what I enjoyed most was uh, your attempt to capture, as you call it, the diversity of a billion voices. Um, 
we do uh, in, in India and certainly the Indian media, we do tend to look at uh, China. Uh, and I think we wrong China in that respect, um, but in, as, a, as a single voice, as Global Times and Global Times and the Communist Party of China being interchangeable, uh, which is a pity, which is a pity for both India and for, uh, uh, for China because um, inflicting global times on the world, uh, I don't think has done China any, uh, any good. Um, but yes, uh, uh, as, I, 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 as I followed your book, I also followed my own uh, uh, journey of familiarity with China, just reporting on China. Uh, 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 what I remember um, that for me was uh, in a sense a, uh, a sort of a cutoff date, if you will, was actually, um, was it the 6th or the 8th of November, uh, September 2008, uh, when we were in Vienna waiting for the nuclear suppliers group to, uh, to decide on a waiver, on a nuclear waiver for India. And uh, it was about uh, one o'clock in the morning when uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese delegation left uh, the building and uh, sort of boycotted the meeting. And it, uh, and it was about two o'clock in the morning when they returned uh, to vote um, for the waiver. Um, and uh, in my view, that, that day was not a day that China had anticipated. I don't think China anticipated that. And in many ways, I see that the gradual hardening of position um, by the Chinese against India, is, I date it to that, uh, that particular event. Uh, that's mine, that's my sense. Um, and I, uh, what I do, but, I mean, while the, the policy part, et cetera, uh, for someone like me is of course familiar and it was a pleasure to walk through those policy uh, areas and those, those histories with you, Anant, in your book. Um, what stood out for me was the range of voices that you put in and uh, brings, brings to us always that uh, China is much more than the Communist Party or much more than Xi Jinping. Although uh, right now I would agree with, uh, with Anand that uh, you don't really get beyond Xi Jinping. Um, so uh, I think everybody's scrambling for at this moment to wonder why uh, his vice president's secretary has just been arrested. And uh, I don't think anybody really knows, um, but, uh, uh, but it's true that in the absence of familiarity, um, the stereotypes between India and China are, uh, have deepened. Um, it was, we saw these stereotypes both uh, playing out in the Indian media, at least in the Indian um, audiovisual media, as well as in China uh, during the last crisis in Doklam. Um, and uh, if you can caricaturize the um, Indian media portrayal of China and Chinese Communist Party. You would also equally caricaturize the um, uh, Chinese media videos of uh, a man in a turban, um, which was uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, famous uh, uh, videos uh, that emerged from China during the Doklam uh, crisis. Um, my sense is that familiarity between the two people um, is desirable. And I think everybody uh, is agreed that it is important uh, for not only better understanding between governments, but between uh, people. But the fact is that as long as you have a, a, an obstacle uh, that we are currently dealing with, we would always run into uh, a barrier. And the only other um, sort of comparable um, example that I can think of is, you know, in the early 2000s, when uh, the US and India were trying to sort of get together and sort of uh, 
uh, be more friendly, so to speak. The one thing that Indian governments, uh, government after government would say is, would be, yes, but the nuclear issue, can we get over the nuclear issue? And it was, it was interesting how, while it did not solve all our problems, once we did get past the nuclear issue, the fact of that we could physically take it off the bench, uh, the fact that in 2010, Obama, um, with his uh, speech at the Indian parliament and supporting India in the UN Security Council, which is really just a political statement, but again, just taking it off the bench, uh, that was actually very important for the health of the relationship. And in my view, a similar, uh, the health of the, or the India-China relationship um, would always be subpar until we can go beyond uh, the fact that either both sides appear to believe that the other is here to take away my territory. I mean, if you read some, at least if you read some of the English language commentary uh, by Chinese scholars or by Chinese thinkers, um, uh, it, 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 it's almost a mirror image of the kind of writing that you see from India, at least in the current crisis. And then you have to sit back and wonder that here is India, which is five, which is uh, this China, which is five times the size of India. And how do you close this particular gap, this gap of mirror imaging of each other's insecurities? And um, so I'm, I'm not sure how we, we plan to do this or how we should address this. But one of the things that um, we really should have is more people, more Indians in China writing, reporting, working, and uh, just understanding uh, the country much, much better than what we do today. And in many ways, I think China's better than this because China's uh, sent many more reporters, many more uh, people to work here. I don't think uh, there has been an equal number of Indians who have uh, gone there to, uh, certainly in the media sector, sec tech sector at all. Um, we used to have a, a, a correspondent in China. We don't anymore. Uh, and that is, a, that is one of the disadvantages of the Indian media. And uh, I think as we go forward, we will run into this, the problem that we are going through right now, uh, the boundary issue that we do need to get beyond that. But it's what we, what one of the things that you take away from reading Anand's book is how over the years, over the decades, we've always tried to say, oh, well, let's box it away. And both sides have been guilty of this, which is um, boxing away the problem. And uh, I think we are, at a, we are at a point in our collective history where we can no longer box away this problem. So I don't see how we're going to improve relations until we take this out of the box, deal with it and move on. Uh, I will I will stop here and happy to take questions later. Thanks, uh, Indrani. And I think this whole question of uh, trying to get over this major sort of the nuclear deal equivalent of the relationship with China is an important one. There's a very nice section in Alan's book where I think he literally transliterates the work of uh, Dai, who's a long-term Chinese special representative. Um, and actually, what's quite interesting that I found in those leaves is that I actually puts the ball in India's court because that at least my reading of that early period is that the Chinese leadership seemed very keen on some sort of an agreement in 2002, 2003. Um, and it was the Indian political problems with the election of the UP in 2004. And it was, I can, according to Anand's reading, if I'm not mistaken, it was only in 2009 that the Chinese thought, okay, maybe perhaps now we can do some business. Um, so we come back to those points. I'm sure there'll be more. And then we'll come to the current crisis for for, for sure. And I think one of the things Anand's book does is help us kind of in each of these segments, whether it's the economy or whether it's the border, try and give us some sort of a flavor of how the other side perhaps read these crises. But with that, let me turn to Taylor Fravel. Uh, 
Great. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Rudra. Thank you very much, uh, Carnegie. And uh, thanks to Anant uh, in particular uh, for writing uh, such a great book. So in my uh, remarks, I'd like to make uh, three points and hopefully touch on a number of the challenges uh, that Anant uh, raises in the book. Uh, first point, though, is that this is just a great book, right? It's a really, really good book. I encourage Everyone who hasn't had a chance to read it, to read it, it's engaging, it's insightful. And basically Anand you know, had a front row seat to the most perhaps conse consequential decade in uh, China's political uh, development, uh, certainly uh, since opening and reform. Um, I think he elegantly captures the complexity of China. Remember, right, China has 56 ethnic groups, 31 provinces and autonomous regions. I think every climate zone from jungle to desert and of course, eight great cuisine types, right? This is an enormously complex country. Um, and I think Anand has been able to distill from it uh, many of uh, kind of the central dynamics in, in a nuanced and thoughtful way. So I think anyone think, who wants to understand kind of China and its complexity and how it's changed in the last decade should read this book. And I can only say, Anand, please uh, tell Harper Collins to make it available in America because I think many Americans uh, would benefit from reading this as well as uh, your natural audience in India. So that's my praise and it's really fulsome and heartfelt and sincere. This is a really terrific book. Uh, my second point um, I think sort of gets to the political challenge but I also think perhaps is the biggest challenge maybe that India faces. And I think I was just mentioned in the previous set of comments, but basically that in India needs to build a much bigger cadre of China experts, right? The issue here, I think, is how can we replicate Anand and, 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 and many others who uh, are, are very sort of sophisticated uh, uh, scholars or analysts of uh, China in India, but really it's a pretty small group. Uh, and I don't mean to mirror image and sort of compare everything to, United, to, to, to the United States, but it's my context. And we have, you know, in this country, going back to sort of the Cold War period and today, right, a, a huge uh, group of uh, uh, sort of people who focus on China with language skills, with time in the country and so forth. And so I was just shocked, right, shocked to read that there are only three or four Indian reporters in China, right? This, I, I had no idea it was that small. Uh, and that uh, I think is quite telling and is a situation that needs to be sort of rectified. If, if uh, China wants, I'm sorry, excuse me, if India wants to learn how to navigate this one party state, it's gonna need more people who understand it and who understand it sort of as authentically as possible and as on, on the ground. I mean, just to relay one anecdote, when I was in graduate school about 20 years ago, uh, I, I, I had to stay at the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing and I got to meet a very young, newly recruited uh, Indian diplomat whose name I now cannot remember, which is embarrassing. Uh, and uh, he had been sent to learn Chinese for a year and we got to talking and he was the only person in his entire intake who was gonna be focusing on China, which means now, right? With someone who's seasoned 20 years later, um, it, it, it's pretty small. So I, I just think that um, if one wants to wrestle with understanding the political challenge that a non play, that one is gonna need uh, more expertise. Um, and it, to me, it seems pressing and urgent, right? So uh, I, I think it's terrible um, that, well, I just like the Global Times for many reasons, but I think it's terrible that the Global Times is the main source of information about China and India because of the English version, right? We sh all of these stories should be coming, or, or, or most of the reporting should be coming out of China. Um, so how to change this? Um, maybe the US experience is a model. Um, because uh, sort of the U.S. cadre of expertise on China had a had a geostrategic rationale. There was a huge series of investments in the early '60s, basically in the Cold War, right, to build up area knowledge in the United States across a range of countries where there was going to be competition with the socialist bloc. But this led uh, to sort sort of the founding, in many ways, of modern Chinese studies in the United States. And then, of course, today uh, or in the last decade, is sort of the relationship is worsened again, uh, I think you've seen a pretty dramatic increase. So I don't know what is needed on the Indian side, if this is just more financial support from the government, more career incentives in different organizations, but it's really hard for me to see how uh, India can meet many of the challenges without more people who can sort of uh, understand uh, the China uh, problem in the way that Anand 
has been able to do and so expertly and deftly does uh, in this book. Um, uh, my third point is uh, that, that I want to touch on the border challenge, um, which I really view as a combination, right, of the diplomatic challenge and the history challenge, right? This is sort of, I think, India's supersized challenge. And what I want to do um, is to endorse the solution uh, that Anant has proposed, namely of a compromise, because this is the one issue, as we've seen over the summer, I don't want to get in to the most recent details, but it clearly is is the issue that could lead to another major uh, military conflict uh, between the two countries, which I think would be disastrous uh, for both. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think the only way uh, that uh, most, or, or, or the way that most territorial disputes get settled, whether they involve India and China or other countries, especially when they've endured for a long period of time in the way that this one had, has, is that basically you get settled, you, you settle them through compromise and you basically keep what you have, perhaps with some adjustments here and some adjustments there, but you wouldn't have major adjustments. And so we seem to be in a situation now where uh, India wants to um, sort of pocket everything in the Eastern sector and make as many possible gains in the Western sector. Uh, I don't think that lends itself uh, to a compromise solution. Of course, uh, here we're just talking about the Indian side and we can talk later about whether or not China is open to a compromise solution. Although I think uh, because they have offered it several times in the past that, that, that they probably are. But also the alternatives to not compromising, right, are, 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 are much worse in the long run, um, right? First, the current situation I think is unsustainable where you have uh, many areas where the two sides don't view the, the line of actual control as lying in the same place. So now, especially in the Western sector, we have these disputes within the dispute. Um, and as infrastructure improves on both sides, you're only gonna see more troops, uh, more patrols confronting each other, more crises and so forth. Uh, and so uh, I, I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, another option would be to, to, to um, turn the line of actual control into a line of control. Um, I think this is happening on the north and south banks of Pangong Lake. Uh, that is also quite volatile. Um, and given the capacities of the militaries on both sides, uh, could be prone to escalation uh, as well. And the third option to compromising, right, would be to clarify the line of actual control and maybe create some buffer zones. But this would be terribly hard work that would be, I think would be very similar to negotiating what the final boundary might look like. And so one might just say, well, let's try to push uh, for a compromise uh, solution. Uh, the one caveat I want to mention here uh, comes from a, a real nugget that Anant has in the book about the Western sector and Kashmir in particular. And so one insight that comes out of the book, I think from an interview uh, with either a Chinese scholar or a diplomat was, how uh, apparently uh, in the exchange of maps for the Western sector in 2002, it was uh, India's desire to include Kashmir as part of that conversation that then, then led China to sort of uh, uh, withdraw its map and uh, stop talking. And the nod, please correct me if I don't quite have the details right here. But I think the bigger point is that um, this linkage, there's this linkage uh, that, that I think India would like to make between uh, sort of uh, uh, Ladakh, as well as uh, uh, Kashmir in terms of the areas between uh, what Pakistan controls today and China. And that will probably hamper any settlement um, uh, on the Western sector itself. But I think there's a way out of this, which is to say in the agreement that China signed with Pakistan in 1963, there is a, an article which very clearly states that once uh, the status of Kashmir is resolved, that then um, uh, this stretch of the border between China and what Pakistan controls uh, can be uh, renegotiated <clears throat> uh, or, or can be addressed again, right? So, so that can be frozen, I think, in the search for a compromise uh, solution uh, elsewhere. And China has already indicated back in this 1963 agreement that it will freeze it. And so I think um, <clears throat> what is so, I guess, or, or the promise of a compromise solution is that it gives each something gives each side a way to claim victory uh, and walk home with uh, the territory that or come home with the territory uh, that matters to them most and um, can help put the history uh, situation in the rearview mirror and can help address one of the main military challenges. So I'll stop there, but it was a terrific book, uh, and I'm delighted to have had uh, a pleasure to have to have this uh, opportunity to comment on it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Taylor. I was hoping to save the weeds on the border for later, but you got straight into it. Um, and it's a good thing now we're going to be turning to 
Srinath, a historian, someone who has served on some parts of the border in his earlier avatar. Um, but before I do, Anand, you know, given Taylor's comments, which is, so let's put the current crises aside for a second, because there are just too many dynamics associated. There's no way there's going to be any business with China, or any kind of business close to usual for quite some time. But if we just abstract that for a second, my reading from your book was that there was some appetite for a compromise, perhaps in the early 2000s. But the view at the moment, if I read the last part of your book right, was that the approach in China seems to be is, um, let's talk about everything apart from the border and kick that can down the road. And I mean, that's certainly what Srinath and I had also heard when we were in Beijing last year. But would that would that capture it right? I think so. Uh, I think from everything that they've said publicly, at least, uh, and everything that you read in the Chinese press as well, the things, the common line of argument is uh, China offered these compromises in the past in 60, uh, 1960, 20 years later. And then by some accounts, according to Dai Bingguo, uh, in in the early 2000s as well. And the argument that they make is uh, it was India that was never able to compromise. Uh, and now they seem to suggest at least, uh, so does Dai Bingguo in his book, that that offer is no longer on the table. And I think there are signs that in the last 15, 20 years or even longer, but as far, especially as, as far as Tawang is concerned, they seem to have publicly said repeatedly that that's something that they would uh, really find it hard to part with. So, but I think that to, I would agree with Taylor's broader point and everything that he said. And I would just add that the one other point that I make in the book is, uh, it seems to me that there is also a Chinese view that uh, that to some degree, they view having this unsettled border as some kind of leverage. Uh, and, and that seems to be something that I came up, the impression that I came away with. But I would, of course, uh, add an asterisk, which is that I, we can't assume their views are ossified. And I think if you look at the last 40, 50 years, there is evidence to suggest that these things change, which is why perhaps optimistically, I make a case for why uh, India on its part should, should be willing to at least do what it can to, to push for a settlement at least uh, to expose the Chinese claim that it's India's obstructionism that is the biggest obstacle. Before I just turn to Srinat again, Taylor is reflecting on some of your own work in your latest book. There are 10 fairly powerful pages in Anand's book that looks at the reorganization of the military inside of China, the effects that that has had on the political leadership and clearly now a skewed civil military kind of dynamic how do you see that playing out when it comes to issues like the border crises and potential for negotiations, empowered theater commanders, um, et cetera? How does that play out? Taylor? Oh, um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I thought mm -hmm. that was to an odd. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, there is, <clears throat> again, I, and I apologize for getting us to the border dispute, but it's a big part of Anand's book. So, uh, you know, I, and it's something I study, so it's not un, unsurprising. I, I don't think that there's any civil military crisis in China. So I think what's happening on the border has um, the, the um, <clears throat> approval from uh, the highest levels. You can't move the kinds of forces that have been moved along the border without approval of the Central Military Commission which is now the chairman's responsibility system, which means it all goes up to Xi Jinping, right? And so this is very clearly much a, a, a centralized effort. Um, and I think, you know, of course one can't, at the same time, one doesn't want to say that every individual decision at the tactical level by a squad is approved by the center, certainly, but, but I think the main thrust of what the PLA is, is doing uh, re reflects uh, the wishes of uh, the chairman of the, uh, of the CMC, which would be Xi Jinping. Um, and now, of course, as it's become a much larger uh, crisis with, I mean, the reports keep escalating and it's, there's no way to verify. Then we went from 40,000 troops on each side to 50,000 and some reports are 60,000. These are, this is a, you know, this is a large you know, number of military forces, uh, very, very significant in size and scope. And so that would clearly be something that I think would be um, managed at the very highest levels in China. Thanks, Taylor. And with that, Turn to uh, thanks, Rudy, and uh, thanks, Anand, first of all, for writing this book and uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about all these interesting things. Uh, you know, it, uh, just to echo a couple of points that uh, you and Indrani made, I think it's fair to say that, you know, China is perhaps the 
uh, you know, it, it's it's over analyzed and under reported as far as India is concerned. Uh, I think there is a talk of very poorly informed knowledge about China, which informs a lot of our discourse. Phrases like the Middle Kingdom mentality, etc., trip off our tongues as if they are gospel truths. Even if no serious historian of China will subscribe to any of those uh, notions of how the Chinese conceived of their own relationship with the rest of the world, I think even the extent of English language scholarship on China uh, remains thoroughly under sort of uh, utilized and rarely invoked in the context of our discourse on China. So I think it's not just that we need much more of people like Anand, but I think we just need a lot more study of China, even using non-Chinese language sources, English language sources in the context of a country like India. And I say this is someone who teaches at a university as well, which is that uh, I really think our education system needs to come to terms with the fact that China is a central part of the story of modernity in the 21st century. And if we want to prepare our students and our country for this future, I think it's, it's only incumbent on us to study it with the kind of seriousness which it deserves, which unfortunately is not the case. Uh, I'm sorry to say in much of the writing, commentary, uh, nine o'clock television news, notwithstanding uh, in what happens uh, in the Indian context. And I think that's a very uh, sad thing. And I think Anand really puts a uh, finger on that. Anand's book is distinctive because he is perhaps the first Indian to have done a sustained work of reportage coming out of China. And to that extent, I think uh, this book itself will become part of some kind of history going forward, uh, uh, perhaps as a trendsetter and, and hopefully a harbinger of the trends to come, which is to say that many more people actually go live, learn the language, understand the society and make an effort, just as we do with many other parts of the world, with which we perhaps are more familiar. Uh, and Anand's book, uh, as he himself said, is actually a lot of the book is about China. It's, it's not really about India and China. And to that extent, I think, you know, it's, it's a very interesting vantage point of how someone who comes from India, who's lived much of his life in India, who's formed in India, really goes and encounters China and tries to understand, unravel its complexities. So I think it's, it's a fascinating read from that point of view. Uh, but I suppose given the discussion we are having now and what uh, is likely to be of interest to many of our, uh, you know, people who are on the call is the whole India-China dynamic. And, and I'd really like to just touch on a couple of points, uh, something which uh, both Anant and Taylor uh, and Indrani also have already mentioned, uh, which is about the whole sort of boundary thing, just very briefly, but also then a little bit about what the role of history in the whole thing is. Uh, I just want to sort of use this opportunity to talk a little bit about um, that aspect of it, right? So the first point is that, you know, just a couple of interesting nuggets which stood out for me from Anand's book as well. Um, on the LAC, right? I mean, so so there is. Uh, it is very interesting that um, the provision for clarifying this amorphous thing called the LAC was there in the 1993 uh, agreement, and it's it's been there as uh, something on the agenda, so to speak, to be done, right? Uh, and we know that in the middle sector, the maps were actually exchanged, but when it came to the western sector, uh, you know, the Chinese initially sort of saw our maps and then said, let's close off this exercise, right? And what were the reasons? I, I think Anant mentions this point about India's map actually also including those parts of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which are under the control of Pakistan uh, today and perhaps have been since 1947, yeah? And uh, that the Chinese refused to sort of countenance for two reasons. Uh, I think the first reason is that Already in 1960, and this is a very important point, from 1960, the Chinese have said very clearly that they will not discuss Pakistan occupied Kashmir as far as any of these negotiations are concerned. So I think the fact that the Indians in 2002, and Jaswan Singh was a foreign minister at that point of time, uh, April 2002, the maps were exchanged. It was either the 17th or the 27th of April. And the Chinese immediately said this is not acceptable. Given their relationship with Pakistan, I think this was only to be expected. And perhaps it was an avoidable diplomatic misstep on the part of India. And I think that's something that Anand's interlocutors tell him. Uh, of course, the Indians believe that the Chinese are simply rationalizing uh, a decision taken for other reasons. Uh, and the dominant Indian view is that the Chinese just want to keep this issue open. I don't think that's quite a correct reading. I think what Taylor said earlier is an important consideration on the part of the Chinese, which is that if the LAC clarification is going to take a long time, and if that exercise actually yields something like a commonly agreed upon LAC, but if the Indians continue to show no further interest in actually settling the border, then the LAC becomes a de facto border, which the Chinese do not want to uh, allow to be the case. Because they have been absolutely clear that while they accept the LAC as an 
you know, administrative arrangement of some convenience that cannot be the final border. That's been their position since 1999. I think all of these things are just worth reiterating so that we don't continue to misunderstand and to portray as if their positions are very different. For instance, you know, recently when the Chinese said that we have clarified our notion of the LAC, uh, you know, on whatever, 8th of September 1959, when Chawanlai wrote the Nehru, you know, there was, it was headline news in Indian media. That's only because most of our people don't know what that history is. The Chinese have consistently maintained that that is the case. The question is, what exactly does that line amount to, which they have never clarified. Yeah. So I think it's uh, important, therefore, to get the Chinese perspective on this and not to assume that our assessment of their thinking is the only way that things work. Yeah? So we have to fundamentally understand that there are two sides to this problem and each side comes with a certain perspective. Uh, this leads me to the second sort of related issue, which is that of the boundary settlement. Itself, right? and, um, and I think Anand kind of goes through the history from the 1950s. Uh, Anand, I must uh, frankly say that you know, there were some points where I did not agree with your sort of reading of what happened in the 1950s. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, your claim that India's decision to show clear boundaries in 1954 through its maps, uh, you know, in some ways precluded all forms of negotiation. I don't think that's true. I think even the documents which have been declassified with the Ministry of External Affairs in the last four or five years tell a picture which is quite different, uh, which is that the Indian government was actually not at all focused on the Western sector throughout this period, right? Aksai, it, there is a note uh, prepared by the MEA in 1953, just ahead of our negotiations with Tibet, which says very clearly that Aksai is one of those areas which are disputed in the Western sector. And if it comes up for dispute, if the Chinese insist on talking, we should be prepared to talk. Right? And this is a point that Jawaharlal Nehru subsequently, even after the 1954 issue of maps makes. So what is the problem in the 1950s? And I think the 1950s are educative because what they suggest is that the real problem was not about finding ways of compromising but it was a total collapse of trust, which happened in 1959. It happened following the Dalai Lama's fleeing from Tibet and the Chinese assuming that India was instrumental in that. It happened on the Indian side because of the killing of Indian soldiers along the contested borders uh, in, in Longju and then subsequently in the Western sector as well. So I think that's a very important lesson for us to remember today, that the boundary settlement is not going to be simply about finding acceptable formulae. Formulae can always be found. Trust is required to make anything stick. And that is where I think the fundamental problem with this summer's issue has been. What has happened this year has set back the question of trust in a much, much bigger way. Not just in a military sense of saying whether we can sort of trust the Chinese to keep their word on this or that, but that what does it mean to this? Right? And that was the central problem even in the April 1960 Nehru Chowan Lai negotiations. You know, and then you say that you know, in some ways Chowan Lai was more willing to make a compromise. But what was the Indian concern? The Indian concern was that, can we trust the Chinese actually to live up to anything that they say here at this point of time? And that becomes a very important political question because it is not just Jawaharlal Nehru, but every cabinet minister of his, barring Krishna Menon, who says we cannot trust the Chinese. And all of that is now documented, available for us to see. In fact, when uh, you know, Chauhan Lai met Morarji Desai, he actually walked out of that meeting. That how, that's how bad things were. Uh, back in uh, 1960. And the context of a lack of trust is, I think, one of the central learnings that we have to take away from this complicated history. Uh, because, you know, I, I understand today, if you're thinking about the border issue, you to say that, listen, there is a problem, which is to say something like Tamang, right? Which the Chinese, when, since when are the Chinese claiming Tamang? Since 1985. Yeah. That's the first time in the uh, talks that they said that, you know, in the Eastern sector, India has to make compromise and subsequently said that has to be Tamang. Obviously, Tawang, in some ways, as you say, is non-negotiable for India because it's an area where, uh, which is very highly Indianized, so to speak. School children speak Hindi in Tawang. It, Tawang returns a member to the of parliament to the Indian uh, Lok Sabha. So these are very important things from our system's perspective. So, and as you say, perhaps the Chinese know it, right? So, so what then is the uh, scope for compromise is perhaps something to be trusted. Now, that said, I do agree with you and with Chael that there has never been a government in India which has ever seriously considered what will it take in order to get a settlement? What will India have to give up in order to have a settlement? Is a question that I believe no Indian government has in seriousness ever considered. And perhaps it may be time to consider that, yeah, as you are saying. But let me just end on a slightly pessimistic note by pointing out two or three reasons why I don't think that's likely in the current context. Uh, the first is apart from the issue of trust and what has happened in the very recent thing, if you look at the trend line, which Anant, your book brings out as far as China is concerned, very clearly, 
under Xi Jinping, there is a, you know, a very strong kind of projection of the leadership. There is a rejuvenation of certain forms of Chinese nationalism. Your interlocutors say, you know, how back in the day, if Zhou Enlai decided to do something or Deng Xiaoping decided to do something, nobody could sort of, you know, go after him on whatever, some microblogging site. Whereas today, all of that is not controllable in some ways, right? Um, but I think that trend operates in India as well, right? One of the very striking things to me about even the past crisis is how many times the official spokespersons of both sides have referred to our two leaders and their understanding. It is almost as if these two leaders stand in for these two governments. And the personal understanding between Modi and Xi Jinping, uh, in, in some ways, is the way that this issue is going to be handled. And that, I think, doesn't make for a very easy settlement. Uh, because at the end of the day, then you're putting one person and their legacy and their conception of what they are at stake. I think a degree of depersonalization of this relationship actually would have helped. We have gone in the opposite direction uh, of highly personalized styles of diplomacy. Uh, between two leaders who are very, very conscious of what their image is, not just at home, but also at abroad. And I think that is definitely a difficult issue. Uh, actually, it militates against uh, a settlement of the kind that you advocate. The second thing is that how both sides have been thinking about their own past and using it, right? And we know about this in the context of China. Uh, in fact, there's another, to coincide with your book, a uh, new book by Rana Mitter, which talks about how China has been using its memory of the participation in the Second World War, et cetera. But more broadly, you know, we, we, we know, and your interlocutors also make this point about China's century of humiliation and how that long history shapes, right? But what is striking to us in India is that we have also started adopting elements of that discourse. We now routinely refer to ourselves as a civilizational state, obviously a trope and a model which is borrowed from you know where. Uh, our foreign minister recently said that India has had two centuries of humiliation. Yeah, so, so we, are, we are twice as bad in some ways. And there is even a price tag which is apparently attached to it. $25 trillion siphoned away by the British. So if this is the way that we want our past to relate to our current identity, then I am not sure that either India or China is going to be in a position to sort of compromise because these borders are then fundamentally playing to your sense of what your national identity is and what you think that history means in the current context, right? Instead of saying that we are two confident countries which are going to be important players in the 21st century and that we need to put this issue behind us if we want to make any kind of progress, as Indrani suggested and Trader suggested, you know, we are harking back to modes of thinking and this thing, which, which are going to make it much more difficult for a compromise. So, you know, so my alternatives are if you cannot solve an issue, you should manage it. If you cannot manage the issue, you will have to endure it. I'm afraid where we are today in 2020, I think endurance is our fate. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be much more optimistic than that. Let me stop there. Okay, thanks, uh, Srinath. So there's a question from Mahindra Gaur, which Professor Mahindra Gaur, which I think relates to some of the points that have been made over here, which is the importance of personal diplomacy and clearly referring to Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Modi. But before I come to that, Srinath, let me ask you a question. Is if your thesis is that you need a more institutionalized process by which you deal with the border to understand the border, to manage the border in itself, which is well taken. But at the same time, this the special representative process was well active in the first one and a half decades of the 21st century. If I'm not mistaken, it was in 2012 that Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon and I on the Chinese side exchanged notes, initial the notes, which is what we got to know after the Doklam crisis to take stock of the border issues in themselves. Clearly, that institutional process didn't go too far either, right? So I guess at some point, aren't we essentially what we're looking for is if you are looking to recover trust or to even create that trust between two sides. Um, I guess in the last few years, the move was to create the trust at the political level. But the hope was that at some institutional level bottom at the, bot at, at the lower ends, um, you'd be able to kind of get down to the actual business. Would you agree with that kind of basic characterization? Um, see, I agree with you to the extent that uh, the SR process, uh, in a sense, and what its course was run, right? And, and I, I think Anand's book and the excerpts that he provides us from Taiping Guo's uh, memoirs, I think they're broadly accurate, which is to say that, you know, in, see, again, the relationship between the LAC and the boundary comes through once again in this case, right? The Chinese said no further to LAC clarification talks in April 2002. But they agreed to begin the SR process because they said, instead of banging our heads on the LAC, let's just try and settle the border itself. 
because that is a better solution from our point of view for the problem. Vajpayee was open to it. And then the Chinese said, we'll go for a package settlement, which to Prime Minister Vajpayee's full credit, he was the first Indian political leader to accept it. And that, I think, was a very important move, which enabled this thing to happen. And then, of course, you had the 2005 parameters agreement. But the reality is that between 2005 and whatever, 2012, 2014, or even subsequently, uh, a lot of that negotiation was not done at the level of political leadership. And actually, Anand quotes both Tai Bingo and Shiv Shankar Menon saying pretty much this. None, neither of them had the mandate to discuss what is it that we can give up and what is it that you can give up. The discussion never got to that stage. The discussion was about preliminaries, which are important from a procedural point of view, to say, now we have got it to the point where the political leaderships have to take a call on what is it that they are willing to give up by way of compromise, because everyone knows that there has to be some give and take. Even if we want the closest to the status quo, there will still have to be some give and take. Uh, there is going to be nothing short of that. And I don't think we ever got to it. And I think, in fact, we regressed from it. Because if you look at when Prime Minister Modi came to power, see, the Chinese expectation, as uh, Anand points out quite clearly, was that he's a prime minister with a very strong mandate. So they believed that, unlike the UPA, which was kind of weaker and more inwardly focused, etc., maybe there's going to be uh, more play. But the reality was that Prime Minister Modi's first pitch was going back to LAC clarification. So from the Chinese point of view, it's a turning back of the clock. You know, his uh, permanent, uh, you know, his special representative was not appointed for several months. We know that. Uh, and, and then when the process began, it's kind of dragged out because there is no political interest on either side to give this priority. Instead, what was priority initially was to attract Chinese investments from this thing, to try and create a personal repo, to say that, listen, if the two leaders understand each other, we are going to have a better time. And not to say that personal understanding does not matter, but the level of personalization of this diplomacy which has happened I think is is almost max of you know a very different time in diplomacy. You know when 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 heads of state used to be rulers rather than democratically elected leaders or leaders coming through certain kinds of processes like in China. Uh, and I think we are paying the price for that, and we will continue to pay the price for it. Uh, in some ways, also it it boils down to the personality of the two leaders, right? I mean they are very assertive people who have come through a very difficult system. And uh, you know just as Prime Minister Modi, Anand uh, tells the story of Xi Jinping's rise about how difficult it was to actually even get a leg up in that system. So these are tremendous political entrepreneurs. Uh, but I don't think that makes for good diplomacy. Dani, if I could just turn to you, do you agree with that? That it does not, in fact, work for diplomacy in itself and that, in a sense, it's backfire. You follow this more closely than many. Do you agree with that basic framing? So, you know, a uh, um, couple of things. Uh, one is that let us assume that there is, there is no Prime Minister Modi who is, as Srinath pointed out, a, a different kind of a prime minister. I go back to uh, the 2005 uh, political parameters uh, agreement that, uh, uh, again, Srinath referred to. And uh, it was against, it was, if I remember correctly, it was again April 2005 when we signed the political parameters. Uh, by the time, in, in five months, the Chinese side walked back from one of the central tenets of the political parameters uh, agreement, which was on the settled on the issue of settled populations not being asked to move. They and they have they've never they walked back from that that killed that agreement right there. It was just before a visit and this and this was nowhere before when when Xi Jinping was in power at all. So it's not just Xi Jinping and his towering personality that is uh, here, or Modi and his personality. Uh, I think we've been, we've been sort of uh, afraid to look at the core of the problem, which is not just a compromise on the ground of where the line should be. By in, in 2020 and, you know, whatever else happened, even in 2005, even 2009. The point is it became a question of power. It became a question of sovereignty and nationalism. And that was no, not going to be addressed by uh, 100 kilometers, square kilometers, um, this way or that way. You can say that you know four or eight square kilometers between finger four and finger eight uh, why why is why are we uh, battling about that i think it's much more than that space it's much more uh, so we've so to say that we've 
um, we need to go back to uh, clarifying the boundary. I don't really believe that that can work with um, uh, officials or map makers, etc. That again has to be a much more political uh, agreement, which in the current circumstances, there is a Xi Jinping who's not going anywhere. He is there for life. You, Xi Jinping is not going to deal with a, a group of ministers in India. Xi Jinping, if he has to deal with anybody and if he will deal with somebody he considers who has a mandate or is uh, a corresponding leader in the Indian system. So we cannot, the, the, the processes of our system and cannot are not replicated in the processes of their system. So we will have this problem. This problem is not, this is not so the question of a boundary settlement and I agree with Taylor that it's, a, a boundary settlement will require compromise. I think we have all politically moved away from uh, a space where that compromise will be possible. Certainly for an in Indian, from the Indian context, uh, for an Indian prime minister to explain to parliament, uh, which is polarized, which is uh, sort of where uh, political uh, uh, differences are very sharp, to explain to Indian parliament why um, X thousand square kilometers uh, are no longer Indian territory. If you remember, if you go back to the Bang Bangladesh line, land boundary agreement, in uh, which uh, could not be done in 2011 and needed to be, and was done in 2015, that was that was uh, uh, so easy. But you, if you if you just go back to the kind of difficulties, the political difficulties we all had, uh, it gives you just a tiny, tiny glimpse into the kind of. Uh, political difficulties that we would have in terms of, so it's easy to say that yes, we should compromise and etc. But where would we compromise? As Srinath very correctly pointed out, that Tawang is not going to be uh, uh, on the plate on the plate for from India's side. The Tawang is key to on on the Chinese side. So, so I think it is not a question of a boundary settlement. It is a question of India and China learning to live with each other. And I don't think we have that particular language right yet. Okay, thanks, Indani. I want to move to some of the more kind of economic-minded questions and pick out some parts of the book. But before that, Taylor, if I can just turn to you, we've got two questions from R. Kumar and Deep Pal, which essentially kind of magnify the argument that Indrani just made, which is that, do you think we're moving to a place right now where competing versions of nationalism will actually impede the ability to create something of a modus vivendi or some kind of commonly acceptable language to even begin to create trust between these two very large Asian countries? No, that's a great question. I mean, certainly, you know, a hallmark of Xi Jinping's China, right, has been a much more strident approach to sovereignty. Uh, and although China settled many territorial disputes in the past, the ones that remain, uh, the six that remain have all been sort of intensified, um, in part perhaps because of their underlying value and importance for China. And so um, I guess I, I share some of the sentiments from other members of the panel, right, that even though a compromise solution is the way that really the only way in which you will solve this short of brute force, uh, which is not attractive or, or possible, that nationalism will probably get in the way, right? Um, and uh, clearly, uh, she has staked the China dream uh, in part, you know, in sort of very vague claims about nationalism and so forth. But I guess to be, you know, just to provide a, counter perspective, right? This also has, your nationalist impulses have to be weighed against your other interests. And so uh, I think the question will be, are there gonna be things that India and or China, or perhaps just China in this case, value more uh, than whether it's finger four or finger eight, right? Um, or, or however, you know, it gets drawn. And I think, you know, one possibility is as China's relations with the US continue to deteriorate at some point, I don't think China will want to have a truly hostile relationship with India on its southwestern flank, which is where probably things are headed now, because um, there doesn't look like there's going to be any movement on the boundary. And so that I think that's a source of concern. On the question of Tawang, I, let me just say briefly, at least my understanding, and maybe uh, Srinath and Anant have a different understanding and in, in Rani, but 
it sort of appeared at a time when India was pursuing, wanted to pers you know, negotiate each sector of the border separately. And I think China didn't sort of like that. And I think Taiwan came up as a way to basically have something to ask for uh, in the East um, if, if that was going to be negotiated separately from the West. But if we return to a pack, if there really is a package deal approach, then I think uh, the question of Dalong perhaps um, is a more uh, manageable. But nevertheless, I wouldn't want to underestimate the power of nationalism. And I think the way in which at least Srinath captured it in terms of the way in which diplomacy has become personalized and that sort of inherently intensifies nationalist impulses because that's, I think, sort of the basis perhaps on which these leaders feel most confident. It, it is not a, a rosy or optimistic scenario. Right. Okay, Alan, I'm just going to turn to the econ some of the questions on the economy, but if I just turn the question on a border, on the border issue the other way around, do you think China has a plan when it comes to the border dispute? Is there an acceptable plan inside of China in terms of what they might actually want? Yes, there is, Rudy. I don't, I mean, I don't see it. Uh, it seems to me that uh, as far as, uh, as far as what they say, uh, I think the, the, the general trend seems to be that this isn't the right time to settle it and it's best to be left to the next generation is, is something that you hear often from them. And I think that uh, one professor in Shanghai put it really well, and this quote really stayed with me, is that uh, the way he put it, he said that the big difference between the way China looks at it and the way India looks at it is that uh, the Chinese don't think it's the right time because of the current state of the relationship. And they think that only when the relationship gets better uh, is the boundary something that uh, both of them can look at. But he says, well, the Indians look at settling the boundary as a prerequisite. So you're stuck in this terrible cycle in this catch-22. Uh, so I would agree with all of them that uh, with, with, with Srinath and Indrani and Taylor as well, that uh, because we are stuck in this cycle, uh, it's, it's, it seems to be something very difficult to break out of. In the book, I do mention this heady feeling in 2014 uh, when, uh, when, when following the election victory of uh, Narendra Modi in India that he did feel he was going to break out of the cycle. Uh, and there was this uh, moment in uh, 2015 when they had opened up this new border uh, route through Nathula Pass and you had a, a BJP member of parliament lead a delegation uh, or a group of Indian pilgrims. And the, the whole, and the Chinese ambassador had driven all the way from Delhi uh, to Sikkim. And this was this big moment uh, right around the time when uh, Prime Minister Modi made his May 2015 visit to China. And there was this whole feeling that, you know, they were on the cusp of something new. But then of course, I think this, this breaking out of this cycle turns out to be far more difficult than every new uh, leadership that comes to the helm. And they discover this very quickly. And I think that's where we are. Uh, and I would very briefly agree entirely that this this feeling of nationalism in both countries has just made it so much more complicated. Where I had one Chinese professor tell me that people will say Xi Jinping is selling the country if he if he did this, uh, even if maybe it is an exaggeration. And I think ultimately the power of the party state in China is such that if they did decide to do it it's far less of a problem than what we would have in India, as I think Srinath and Indrani mentioned. I mean, there's an interesting part of your book, if I read it correctly, where you seem to suggest that, where you suggested, you did an interview with Maji Ali, the you know, long-term China expert, where it, in fact, I found it quite interesting. Maji Ali says, is that public opinion, as far as the border dispute or the crisis with India is concerned, is a problem for China. And then a couple of pages later, you had Ambassador Shivshankar Menon who said, well, actually, I actually don't think public opinion is such a big issue in India. And I think he referred to the 1993 Peace and Tranquility Agreement, which he negotiated, where he said is that we estimated that public opinion is going to be a big deal, but actually it was not. So which kind of turns the head on our usual assessments of the power of public opinion in shaping outcomes. Um, were you surprised by that finding? I mean, in the time that you spent in China, do you feel that, you know, has public opinion now been kind of correlated or equated with the rise of Xi Jinping's own version of nationalism? Is that the equation? I put it slightly differently, Rudy, in the sense that I think sometimes we can overestimate uh, public opinion as being something ossified. And often I think it takes leadership uh, in any country to, to take the first step and you'd be surprised that the pub public opinion might be malleable. And, and I think that I see it more as a question of interest rather than public opinion where I think the question that both leaders would have is what do they gain by doing this and what do they lose by doing this? I think it really comes down to that. 
Um, but uh, I think that unfortunately, uh, it may lead us to a situation where only when you realize that the cost of not settling outweigh the cost of settling and that and you don't want to be in a position where you realize that because it's going to take something like what we've seen this summer or worse, uh, which is why I kind of plaintively make the case <laughs> to preempt that. But I would uh, agree with uh, Srinath's very pessimistic take at the end of uh, his remarks. I would agree with, with him entirely that I think we're now in this phase of endurance, uh, I think for the near future as well after the events of this summer. And uh, understanding why China did what it did this summer is something that I'm still scratching my head over, especially after covering in, in painstaking detail the effort that it took to bring the relationship back from the brink after Doklam. You had these two years and these two informal summits, and now you've just, you're not even back to where you were in Doklam. It's, it's far worse. So I think in this current moment, it really does seem to be that for the near term as well, we're going to be stuck in this phase for a while. Thanks, Anand. I'm just going to turn to, we've got a whole range of questions on the economy, on startups, on gating Chinese financing, et cetera. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to name everyone who's asked these questions, but I'm going to club them together. Anand, you did a fantastic piece on Chinese investments into India, albeit for the Brookings in, Brookings India. Um, and then you kind of, you know, there's a lot more detail on that in your book. Um, the Indian government at some level started gating or uh, screening Chinese finances, which interestingly predated the incidents in June, if I'm not mistaken. The first, um, the first set of press notes came out in early April, and then that kind of developed since then. Is How do you see that working out in the future? I mean, as you very colorfully describe in your book, Chinese VC funding is tied to the hip with the growth of, growth of, growth of the startup industry in India. And as you mentioned, it's not just a question of financing. Is a question of structure, and you give a very good example of Alibaba and Paytm, for instance. They even use common colors to make sure that they're part of one large family, the financing apart. Um, given that this is a pandemic hit economy, an economy that in India has been struggling for the last many years, so it's a bit of a double whammy for India, unlike many other countries. India's going to need investments. Um, but as you know, Indrani and Srinath and others have kind of pointed out, and you yourself said is given the China problem that you have, and it's not going to be business as usual, how do we square this circle? How does this work out in the near future? No, so it's been interesting to see the, the shift in attitude uh, in the last few months. Uh, so when this study came out that we did for Brookings India in March 2020, uh, during the course of doing this, I actually got a lot of pushback uh, from, from people within the government uh, that we were being too alarmist about uh, Chinese uh, financing and Chinese companies in India. And the most common question that I heard from people back then, uh, and this was just, uh, you know, not so long ago, uh, the, the most common question that I heard was, why is it that, you know, we are fine with uh, allowing the Western companies, the Facebooks and the Googles to come, but why is it that we must be most, you know, scrutinizing of Alibaba and Tencent? And I actually heard that argument a lot but it seems that the opinion has shifted so much uh, since this summer, uh, even though these, weren't, these aren't new issues. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the banning of apps, uh, more than 100 uh, Chinese apps, even though data security and privacy were the reasons that the government of India stated, I mean, these apps uh, have been in the Indian market uh, since at least 2015 and 2016. Some like TikTok had 300 million users. So everyone was aware of, of the issues at stake, but the boundary is what I think has really changed the debate in India. I think there was a multitude of opinion even within government that there were some people who were in favor of opening up to Chinese investment. I think uh, the amending of the rules, which you pointed out, happened in April before the border clashes. Uh, it pointed to the, I think, the unease that the investment they got from China wasn't what they sought. They wanted Chinese companies to come in and manufacture or uh, establish factories for mobile phone companies, generate jobs for people in India. That was happening, but uh, the most of the kind of money that was coming in was Chinese companies just acquiring stakes in Indian startups. So I think the April amendment was kind of aimed at trying to redirect this, but it doesn't work that way because you've sent a very clear message to Chinese investors that you, know, you aren't welcome in India right now. Uh, so I have heard by word of mouth as well that VCs have either put on pause their plans for India or are looking elsewhere because they are so concerned that uh, this is a very an inflection point as far as India is concerned and that this period that we saw from 2014 to 2020 
where the Indian government was really bullish about creating this new relationship with China, I think it's come to a screeching halt right now. Sheena, if I turn to you, you know, we are now collectively at Carnegie doing some work on the future of India, what the kind of economic future is going to look like in the next few years. You're pivotal to that work. How do you see this work out when it comes to Chinese financing um, and the near future with, with what is essentially an issue now on the border that doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon? Yeah, so I think you know, we just need to place this issue in a slightly longer perspective. And uh, Anand quite rightly pointed out that in 2014, when Modi uh, was elected as prime minister and you know, came, came to power for the first time, uh, there was a very concerted drive to attract investment from China. And we must understand that the background to that was a sort of a very serious downward trend in private investment in India at that point of time, right? And that trend has continued deepened over the period of uh, the past six years. So in a sense, the economic logic of saying that we need uh, Chinese investments uh, was quite clear. And I think the prime minister's efforts were very much bent in that direction. As Anand said, it may not perhaps have resulted in the kind of investment that you wanted, but you've still seen significant inflows. And those inflows are quite important from a macroeconomic perspective as well, right? Because, see, we run a trade deficit with China. Now, if you don't want that persistent trade deficit to sort of be a problem, then you need to have capital flows. I mean, if the capital account has to balance out the current account. So in some ways, this was helping us do that. Now, by stanching these flows and sending out a message that we don't want it, in some ways, we are putting ourselves in a much uh, more difficult situation, right? Of course, you know, uh, Anand quotes many, uh, you know, influential sort of uh, Indian government uh, officials who have worked in China as saying that, you know, we have to make China pay the price for what they're doing. I, I think that that's an understandable sentiment. Uh, but let's face it that there is a price to be paid for India as well. You know, there, there is going to be no one-sided cost which can be imposed on the Chinese. Uh, you know, the absence of Chinese investments will hurt whatever pockets of these sectors that we're talking about. We may prevent the Chinese from, say, carrying out 5G sort of, uh, you know, activity in India. But that will mean then that you are going to be dependent on other players uh, from other countries because there is no question of any Indian alternative emerging in short order unless and until we are able to create a sort of argument that we've been discussing, right? For an open architecture where India kind of takes the lead in terms of shaping a consensus around those kinds of things. That, that will need a lot more thinking and activity on our side. So at this point of time, yes, it may seem like this is a relatively easy way of imposing costs on the Chinese. But I don't think economic sanctions work quite that way, right? I mean, there will be a reciprocal cost that we'll have to pay. And that cost is going to bite us even deeper at a time when we ourselves are struggling to recover and adapt from the pandemic and its consequences. So I think uh, if we want really to think about, you know, what do we do apart from just keeping the Chinese out, then we'll have to do a lot more. And I think that's the kind of discussions we've been having. Uh, in Imran, can I just take that to you for a second? I mean... I mean, we take the point that, you know, any kind of sanctions is going to hurt India in the short term, perhaps even in the medium term, given where we are as far as the economy is concerned. But I guess at some point, if you have to make a move, you have to make a move. And, you know, the government's perspective is that you'll absorb the pain. Um, the key to that is, of course, is that you have to make India attractive as a country for others to actually want to come in and invest. That's the only way you can hedge the bet of unplugging from China. So how do you see this kind of work out? I mean, do you see a backpedaling on getting Chinese finances in the near future, or do you see it in completely tied to the situation on the border? No, no, I don't see it uh, tied. Uh, I don't see it completely tied. I think the government was uh, used the opportunity, uh, the border uh, issue uh, presented, to take steps that they, that uh, certainly the tech security chaps had been flagging within the government for some time. And, uh, uh, to, uh, to Anand's point that a number of uh, officials ob objected to this uh, sort of vilifying of N Tencent and Alibaba, I agree and I've, I find a clear, uh, uh, I used to find a clear distinction between the economic ministries and the uh, security ministries uh, about the approach to China and Chinese investment. But I I'd say one more thing. One, it's very important for us to be able to put the uh, to, to create alternatives to the early stage financing that a number of uh, startups in the Indian tech sector used to get from China. These are easy, this was easy money. And uh, so the Indian system has to um, uh, find alternatives. Second, uh, if you look at Chinese investment, it's not been in the, in the traditional sense of FDI. 
so much. But if you look at Chinese projects in India, for in infrastructure projects, government projects, I, in fact, I would say that what has hurt the Chinese more has been the government procurement uh, uh, bans, uh, on a government project bans. Uh, and there, again, the, I don't see the Indian system um, making up the difference, uh, not in terms of finding alternatives, but in, in terms of making themselves more uh, attractive as a destination. Because, see, if you look at a, a project, a government project, let's say a road, a highway, whatever, and uh, you have five bidders, all five bidders are Chinese. You, you've now taken them off the, off the table, but for many others, India remains a very hard place to do business in, in terms of leave, leave alone FDI, leave alone greenfield investments, but just pure projects. And those things, you, that's, I don't see that, that uh, uh, quickness in making up the difference. So my sense would be that at some point, uh, governments might be tempted to take the easy way out of putting exemptions, that some people, some parts of Chinese investments might get exempted. And uh, that, is, that is the back door or the, you know, the, the, the sort of cheat uh, step uh, out. And I see that uh, happening because I don't actually see them uh, taking the, the steps to make this a more permanent. As for the, as for the apps, uh, it, it was, uh, I, if I remember correctly, two years ago that the first uh, tech um, alarm went off in the Indian system where they looked at something called the UC browser, which comes with every uh, Chinese Android phone and is the, is the default browser. But it, and uh, they did an analysis of the kind of stories that came up on the UC browser when you uh, looked for, when you opened it. And this was during, uh, this was after Dokla. The Dok and the stories were very, very China centric. They almost, uh, so that was the first time they, they, the alarm bells went off in the Indian tech security sector. And it took them what, three years. And I think they used this, the conflict right now to do what they had been wanting to do for some time. Uh, and in, I mean, you know, in the US system, you've seen State Department statements on military civil fusion in China, et cetera, et cetera. All of that has been mirrored in the Indian system. Thanks, Indrani. I'm going to very quickly, we're well over time. So I'm just going to try and finish up with Taylor and then Anand. And I'm going to ask you a question which has very little to do with borders, strategic competition, economy. Taylor, you've spent a lifetime studying China. Anand, you've spent a good decade and more um, walking the streets of China across the field. What do common Chinese, and there are a range of questions, which is actually interesting. There's a range of questions from what I might say younger people, students, people, the next generation of policymakers, thinkers, journalists, and academics. And many of those questions that actually are saying is, what do regular Chinese people think about India? So let's, let's get away from the politics. You know, what does that look like, Taylor? Um, so I will confess, I've not asked many younger Chinese people what they think about India, but, uh, but let me say the following, which is that right, going back to my first point, China is a huge diverse place. It has a pretty you know, now oppressive political system, but individual I mean, Chinese on the individual level are among the most sort of gregarious, loquacious, you know, people you could come across and so you'll get a whole range of views um, on anything, right? I mean, this is, this is not a country where I think there is a monolithic view. I would say in general, and perhaps this is because of the imbalance between um, sort of the importance that China attaches to India versus the importance that in India attaches to China, right? I think most Chinese tend to look perhaps more towards the United States when they're thinking about a, a country that can do them great harm or might have a really big impact on them. And so I think India never, um, you know, and I'm an American too, so I'm talking, obviously my sample is biased, right? So this is, this is not a great way to, a great answer to your question, but to say that, um, um, yeah, so I, you know, I think there's, there's a tendency, at least in, in my orbit for the conversation to be more America focused. I think Chinese international affairs analysts are more America focused than they are India focused. 
but the people themselves are just, you know, you'll get any range of views on anything, right? I mean, this is a, a very dynamic society in that sense. Uh, um, and perhaps that's been quashed a bit um, in, in the last few years, but the underlying kind of dynamism, I think will will come back. I'll leave it at that. And I don't... Anand, if I can ask you, because you know, in even in, even in India now, I mean, you keep meeting students that are Chinese students at JNU. There are there are exchanges, nothing like you know what you describe in your book, which is the university exchanges that take place between, say, China and the United States. Um, but you know, there are still there are still kind of you know, I, I know of internships where Chinese students are coming. Some of that's getting harder because of these rise in competing kind of nationalist views on various things, but. What's the common impression in China? I mean, it's a blunt question. It's a hammer question, but um, perhaps you'll give us a qualified answer. Yeah, I would say that it would depend on who you ask, but I will try and answer that even though I'm going against what I say in my book about generalizing. Um, <laughs> but, but I would say that uh, it would really depend on who you ask. And I think that India is far less, uh, you know, it doesn't evoke the kind of heated nationalist sentiment that you might get with, within the US or Japan. Uh, I mean, people are aware of the boundary and things like that, but I don't think this is their, uh, their dominant sort of interest vis-a-vis -vis India. And I, and I think especially if you look at younger Chinese and those who work, for instance, in the tech sector, up until 2020, you know, over the last two three years, I met so many people who everyone seemed to know someone who was doing business in India, uh, whether it was uh, in terms of uh, tech-related stuff or as Indrani said, even working on projects, uh, project contracting or... or solar power projects in South India, or it was look, looked at as an opportunity, as an economic opportunity. I would say that's one dominant strand that I often encountered. I think culturally as well, I think that there is a huge interest. One of the people I profile is uh, somebody who is the president of the Amir Khan fan club in China. And I think the point that she made was people uh, in her generation who were born in the 80s, uh, who grew up watching Hollywood. Many of them got sick of watching the same old stuff that they got from the US and their interests were becoming broader, more diverse. And they found, for example, Indian films as something that really appealed to them. And these are people born in the late 1980s and 1990s. So I'd say it's a, I would say it's a really diverse spectrum of views, especially when you look at younger Chinese who are less bothered about uh, the history of the 62 war, uh, less bothered about the political issues. And I think that that's something that I really came away with. Thanks, Anand. And we, as I said, we're well over time. Um, and I'm going to thank my panelists in a second. But just want to say is I think if we want to get away from the generalization, there's a very nice line in Anand's, it, towards the end of Anand's books where he says, sometimes I wonder if the mention of China still evokes in people's minds the bygone image of a population all dressed in gray mouse suits. So to the audience, go buy this book. Let's get away from the gray suits. Perhaps let's get away from Maoism itself. And I wish you all the best. Indani Bhakchi, Srinat Raghavan, Dela Pravel, and Anand Krishna. Thank you very much for joining us on India and the World. For our audience, please stay tuned for a very special episode of India and the World on the 28th of October with Ashley Tennis and Soasni Haider on the upcoming drama in the US elections. Till then, have a good weekend and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.